Keep in mind that to a geoscientist in 1906, the theory of plate tectonics, the fundamental mechanism by which we understand how the planet works, wouldn't be formally accepted for another 60 years. The earthquake struck at 5.12 in the morning on April 18, 1906. The fault slipped 21 feet in a matter of seconds. And as it slipped, it sent out waves of energy, earthquake waves that rippled out into the surrounding areas. Police Sergeant Jesse Cook was standing on Davis Street in San Francisco, and he watched the ground undulate beneath him. And he later wrote, it was, this, it was as if the waves of the ocean were coming toward me, billowing as they came. Davis Street split open right in front of me. A gaping trench about six feet deep and half full of water suddenly yawned and sprang up on the sidewalk at the southeast corner while the walls of the building I had marked for my asylum began tottering. Before I could get into the shelter of the doorway, the walls had actually fallen inward, but the stacked up cases of produce that filled the place prevented them from collapsing. Part of what makes the 1906 earthquake so important to a geoscientist like myself is that so many people made observations like this. They noted the time and the intensity of the shaking, and they documented the destruction using photography, which was a new concept in documenting earthquakes. In the years that followed the earthquake, a team of researchers gathered together to study the earthquake in greater detail than had ever been done before. And the team of researchers was led by this stud of a man, the head of the geology department at UC Berkeley, go Bears. His name was Andrew Lawson. And Lawson and his colleagues set out, again, to document the earthquake in greater detail than had ever been attempted before because they had access to much more information, a lot more data. So they began to conduct interviews with the survivors. They documented the destruction themselves, taking photographs, and they made countless measurements around the Bay Area and collected the only 92 seismographic readings of the earthquake, none of which came from the United States. So that was hard work in 1906. In the end, Lawson and his team produced a report, cleverly called the Lawson Report. <laughs> And it totally revolutionized the burgeoning field of seismology. It was also a 400-page document that very few people read. <laughs> but hidden in those pages, embedded in those changes, were the seeds of ideas that would ripple out and become embedded in the rock record. They began by just making observations. Lawson and his colleagues noted that the earthquake appeared to have started on the San Andreas Fault. And while that might sound obvious today, that wasn't known back then. In fact, in 1906, most people, geologists included, thought that earthquakes and all of the shaking created the fault, rather than the fault generating the earthquake. Lawson and his colleagues also noted that the fault had slipped horizontally, rather than vertically. And again, while that seems like sort of a trivial observation, it slipped horizontally, at the time it was thought that earthquakes could only be generated by vertical motions. So with these two seemingly simple, deceptively simple observations, the Lawson Report is already radically transforming our understanding of the natural world and our relationship with it. Lawson also teamed up with a man named Grove Carl Gilbert, who is a legend to nerdy geologists like myself. <laughs> and Lawson and Gilbert set out to map all 600 plus miles of the San Andreas Fault through California. Not an easy job in 1906, on foot and horseback through a lot of poison oak. But they ended up making that trace, and they ended up documenting, again, all of these motions along the fault, these deceptively simple observations. 
And while those are very important, perhaps the most revolutionary concept to be found in the Lawson Report belongs to this man, a geologist from Johns Hopkins University named Henry Fielding Reed. And Reed and his colleagues came out to the Bay Area very soon after the earthquake. And they began to make their own observations. And specifically, they were interested in how the landscape had changed you know, before and after the earthquake. And what Reed and his colleagues noted is that the fault didn't appear to have slipped the same amount everywhere. In fact, they saw that it had slipped a much greater distance where the earthquake epicenter was, and then as you moved away from that epicenter along the San Andreas Fault, it seemed to slip less and less and less and less, as though the crust itself were absorbing some of that motion, a little bit like a rubber band, just sort of elastically absorbing something. This led Reed and his colleagues to propose a new theory on the working mechanics of earthquakes. They postulated that stress and strain would build up on a fault over time, a little bit like stretching out that rubber band, until eventually the friction on the fault could no longer hold and it would slip and generate an earthquake, the rubber band snapping back into place. This theory became known as elastic rebound theory, and to this day, it is still the best working hypothesis we have on the fundamentals of earthquakes. 